gentlemen, do you need me to have the mic or can you hear me like this? It's better with the mic. Alright, well I've found the mic and I'm also going to give you my intellectual look. I wear this for driving and watching TV. So I don't really know myself with these, but I kind of thought I can't peer at the audience. So thank you very much Matt for the very kind introduction. Um, it has me slightly embarrassed. But as I said, I'm going to have an interactive session with all of you. This doesn't want to be didactic because I'd, I'd lose the will to live to myself for an hour and a half. I think you would too. So ask me questions, um, ask you know in things you, that come up in your mind, things that come up in cases. I hope people bought cases. I've got three cases to present, but I've got another three or four in my head I can talk about and fill places. Uh, kindly no heckling, please be kind to me. I'm looking at a few people in the front row here. Uh, okay, so shall we start? As I said, this is going to be an interactive workshop. Would you prefer me standing up, or are you okay with me sitting down? All right, well, let's just see what works. Okay, so eating disorders and self-harm present as complex, multidimensional, pathological behaviors that exact a significant cost from individuals, families, and wider society. We've seen it. We've seen the distraught parents coming in. We've seen the distraught husbands and wives bringing in their loved ones. We've seen the absolute chaos, what eating disorders and self-harm extract on people, extract on the workforce, extract just psychologically on people, and as well on the families of the, of the individuals. So, suicide, to start very charmingly, um, is defined as a self-inflicted death with evidence of intent to die. Pretty horrible. That's actually why, just on a side anecdote, that's probably why I'm a little bit late and flustered today. I had a bit of a crisis this, this morning, as you do. I had, actually very appropriately for this talk, I had an anorexic lady who has been self-harming and to add it all, has relapsed into alcohol. So I had to call a mental health act assessment this morning. And uh, she's on the other side of the country. So we're kind of doing a long distance between the crisis team, the mental health act assessors and myself. So hence, please excuse me being slightly flustered as I was delayed this morning. Anyhow, among psychiatric dis disorders, they're associated with increased mortality. So about up to 20%. The average psychiatric illness has a mortality of about 10% through a patient's lifetime. Eating disorders, 20%. And it is not one thing, most often, say heart failure, kidney failure, respiratory failure, it's going to be suicide. So it's actually something we have to take quite seriously because the numbers can actually be quite frightening. Okay, um, additionally, suicidal, non-suicidal self-injurious behaviors occur quite frequently, we know that. Okay, so both behaviors are thought to serve similar functions. They give relief from distress. So people are, they, they engage in both behaviors as self-soothing behaviors. And they, as I said, they give relief from, from distress. So current findings demonstrate that engaging one of these engaging one of these maladaptive behaviours puts patients at risk <coughs> of engaging in another. And that goes without saying. If you're going to engage in one self-harm behaviour, it's easier thereby to engage in the next self-harm behaviour. Patients are seen to exhibit more impulse behaviour, substance misuse disorders, and in addition, impulse control behaviours. Patients present at a younger age with a history of more interventions as well, for the most part. Okay, so purging behaviours, and I'm always going on with this with my patients, electrolyte imbalance, I'm always going on with potassium, and I tell my patients, lub dub, lub dub of your heart, it's going to go lub dub dub, lub dub dub, and cause arrhythmias. That's actually, in and of itself, can be a killer, an arrhythmia in a patient who's perhaps vulnerable, who's perhaps compromised, abnormal liver function tests, and dental erosion. So you actually see people, very bad dental caries as well in, in eating disorders. NSSI causes as well bodily damage because it involves the destruction of actual bodily tissue. And I mean, patients, we're talking about superficial scratching, but we're talking about some pretty horrendous stuff as well that people can engage in. And some of the stuff, I mean, I'm squeamish actually, and it makes my blood run cold. NSSI and eating disorder behaviours provide negative reinforcement from a form of relief or distraction from subjective distress. So in a sense, they're self-soothing behaviours ironically, because they actually soothe the person's internal distress. And as you see in BPD, very often it's doctor, it's the emotional pain. By actually engaging in the cutting or engaging in the purging, I bring that emotional pain to the fore and it expresses it. It validates it for me, it validates it in front of the world. 
So again, high rates of morbidity and mortality. Clinical samples, mostly from treatments of Europe and North America, and I've chosen Europe and North America because you see more incidence and prevalence of ED rather than the developing world, which actually goes without saying there. Um, describe high rates of suicidal behaviours associated with ED. There's increased clinical awareness about the seriousness of querying together, and this is because of the cost it extracts on the government, on the economy, if you're looking at the NHS, the cost of the it cost, uh, the cost in society, and again, as I talked about, the cost of families, the cost of communities as a wider whole. And I think what's happening recently is that there's increased media attention, which is good because people are more understanding that these things can happen together. So eating disorders involve disturbed eating habits or weight control behaviour that disrupts a person's physical and psychosocial functioning. These can take a wide variety of form and they can form restriction, dietary rules, selective eating, food preoccupations, purging, overexercising, binging, laxatives, diuretics, misuse, that kind of thing. What we're also seeing is the, uh, the rise of the clean eating. You've probably heard of the Helmsley, Helmsley, Deliciously Ella. There's real backlash about this, and I watched something recently, it was a panorama, I'm sure some of you did over here, about the background and the science to these so-called orthorectic type eat eaters. And there wasn't that much science, actually. They really did pick holes in the science. And it's worrying what young people are hearing. Actually, I just think to somebody else earlier on, I was at AFMCP <coughs> recently, which is Applied Functional Medicine and Clinical Practice. I'm very, in, I'm very sort of involved in preventative and lifestyle medicine, and that's how I practice. I believe it's a very good thing to practice. And obviously, nutrition is very, very big there. And the room is kind of divided up into nutritionists and physicians, predominantly GPs, there are about 10 psychiatrists. I think what really worried me was how zealous some people were about nutrition and exclusion diets. So, yes, if you're lactose intolerant, you exclude you know, you exclude milk and milk products, but not for everybody. And it's these attitudes which people who know a little bit, but perhaps don't know the whole picture about nutrition, dietetics, biochemistry, who then preach to people who are vulnerable, who then go into these selective or orthorectic type diets, which then can result as an excuse for an eating disorder. Oh no, it's not, and you'll see one of the cases I'm talking about. It's not me eating selectively, it's me eating healthily. So I've cut out milk, I've cut out gluten, I've cut out carbohydrates. What do you eat? Lettuce? And you've got to think about that. So, anorexia nervosa, most often developed during adolescence and continue into adulthood. Defined by the, th yep, Sorry. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Just a, a couple of slides earlier. Yeah. Um, am I right in thinking, I think even the one before that, you were talking about, yeah, okay, so the, the, the last point there. That's, I think I heard you say that an, a, a eating disorder and another form of cell phone, like cutting oneself, bring the pain to the floor and therefore release the pain. In some cases where they're using the actual binging, purging behavior as self-punishment, where I was talking to you earlier on. The eating disorder in and of itself, say, say you're binging and you're binging because you fear fatness, because you feel guilty, because you've, you've had, and you've had, and you purge. But in some cases, some people actually use the purging, as you'll see in one of the cases, as a form of self-harm. Not always. It can be part of the binge purge cycle in an ED, which is fair enough. But in some cases, they also use it because that sense of personal loathing, which is very common, the same way you have it in BPD and you have it in ED. That sense of worthlessness, the sense of self-loathing, the sense of not being good enough, they use it as a form of punishment as well. They use restriction as well as a form of punishment as well. I'm not worth it. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to eat. And so I, I, I kind of understand that, but uh, to bring that to the, to sort of akin to cutting oneself mm -hmm. and bringing that pain immediately is important. Yeah. Um, and do you think that's, is, are you suggesting that's the same thing? It can be. It's not always. As I said, Binge purge cycles restricting can be solely part of an ED, but it can be part of a self punishment, self harm. Cutting, very often, I mean, we ask, as a psychiatrist, you ask, why do you cut? Is it a cry for help? Is it a cry, is it a relief of pressure? Or is it actual suicidal intent? And when you actually ask these things, open these things up a little bit, you'd be surprised what people tell you. So sometimes they say, you know, I feel nothing and I want to feel something because I'm in so much distress. So at least by cutting, the pain comes out. I can see the blood. Yeah. It makes the pain real. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, sort of, yes, thank you. No, okay. it does, it does. Okay, good.
Again, please stop me if you have questions. Okay, where was I? Uh, no, one more? Right. So AN. So we're talking about AN, and it's a, it's a tripartite of AN, the morbid fear of fatness. And this fear is all consuming. It eats a person up. If you actually do, if you, I'm sure the psychologists and therapists here have done the diagrams, draw yourself and what you see yourself as, and you see this a person with a BMI of about 12, 13, drawing themselves as this great big person. It's actually very interesting in clinical practice to see what they see themselves as. The restricting behaviors, and as we just now talked about, these can be self-punishment, but these can also be, if I, I always tell my patients, it's not about food and ED, it's about control. And in a world gone mad, this is the only control you can take. You control yourself, you control what you eat. And in a world gone mad, this, this is what they can feel for themselves. And an extreme thinness, so way less than 85% of the recommended weight, which is then can be measured. BN, experienced by up to 3% of the population, characterized by recurrent episodes of binging and resulting compensatory behaviors, so restriction and purging. Body weight and shape has an undue uh, influence of self-evaluation. I'll talk about one of the cases later on, you'll see about this. It's BN can go from here to there, here to there, and it's a bit more gray. I suppose I was thinking about it earlier on, thinking about how I talk about it, and I almost see eating disorders not as discrete events as themselves, but I actually almost see them like a rainbow of a spectrum. And the eating disorders <coughs> work on the spectrum, and you can actually be anywhere on the spectrum where you can have symptomatology merging into each other with lots of gray areas. You can move from one end to the other end of the spectrum. You don't necessarily stay on one end and define by one end. So very often people who come to me, I prefer to actually, if you've got a label, quote unquote, I prefer to call them a mixed eating disorder because it allows for scope by which side of the spectrum a person is and allows for pendulations on the spectrum depending what's going on with the patient. Okay, so a binge eating disorder, characterized by periods of binging with a compensatory behavior and men and women equally affected. I do have actually have a case with this. The others are coming up with the atypicals. I talked about orthorexia, the selective eating disorder, the gluten freeze, the health food people, the vegans. Um, so, you know, it goes on and on and on. And I think the DSM-5 is coming up with more and more of the atypicals, but anything can actually be an atypical if, it's co if the root is based up here in, about in maladaptive coping skills as opposed to actually eating for health. You know, just an aside, it's quite interesting that conference I went to, a lot of the nutritionists there, or people involved in nutrition, actually came or went to the path of nutrition because of a very traumatic life event that they themselves suffer or a loved one suffers. So, for example, the, the girl next to me was a hematologist, and her daughter had very bad psoriasis, and she came into this sort of got an interest in nutrition because of her daughter's psoriasis, and the <coughs> GP, the other side of me, suffered Hodgkin's lymphoma and they were managing it by diet. But a lot of people actually, you know, came, who came there, came because they were on a journey. And we see this as well, people who have eating disorders, they're on a journey too. So the epidemiology, you can see, is, it varies and in terms <coughs> of binge, it's actually sub, it's surprisingly higher. The sub-threshold reported in women is two to three percent. Frankly, and I, I welcome opinions, I think it's higher. What I see in clinical practice, I mean, think about it. Think about your friends. Think about your peers. Think about your kids' friends. It's actually much higher what we see, but hasn't actually been diagnosed. And I mean, I can see it in my own peers, actually. I see it in my, you know, my friends' kids. Um, I had a very good friend recently, another medic, whose daughter has a BMI of 13, but hasn't actually been formally diagnosed. She's a young kid, she's still developing, but the ED thinking is there. And then an in incident report in men is 0, uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 percent. I believe this is going up a little bit as more and more men are actually coming to their primary care physicians and to psychiatry reporting ED, which actually is a very, very good thing because I think it's a very underrepresented group that we have over here. And I mean, if you see through most of the studies I talk about through this and my case studies as well are all women, men don't always get a look in. and. I don't think, I have one man with an ED, but he also has Asperger's, and very often we see people in the ASD profile can suffer ED. 
but I don't think I should have one clinical case per se in my current caseload. So the incidence of anorexia appears to be stable, whereas bulimia may be in decline in the Western world. Possibly because of media attention, I don't know, but there's definitely a lot more the celebs talking about how they have bulimia and it, it doesn't work, it's scary, it's horrible. But that seems to really be doing something, and there is definitely a decline of bulimia. And I also <coughs> think there's more awareness of people about the health sort of risks of bulimia and the fact that actually, if it's driven by a mode of fear of fatness, as a bulimic, you could have a BMI that's actually within the normal range or actually above the normal range. So you could look like any of us in the audience and yet be bulimic. So for people who actually have this morbid fear of fatness, they know it doesn't work. But the illness per se is there because it's about control and self-loathing. Comorbidity, and I was going to talk about this this morning, how my patient this morning actually. So the number of individuals receiving treatment, only one in three are detected by healthcare. I suppose what underpins both ED and self-harm is shame. And if you have shame, you're not going to go sit and advertise the fact to your GP that I actually have an ED. You're going to hide it. It's about secrecy. It's about control. It's about being so ashamed of yourself. It's about hating yourself, loathing yourself, so you hide it. I mean, the one case I was talking about, who's, I think, case number three, the shame about talking about her ED. It's horrific. She'd much rather talk about her sexual trauma than her ED. So 70% of individuals report comorbidity, anxiety, mood, self-harm, and substance misuse. Actually, this case this morning, who I had called the Mental Health Act Assessment for, had all of the same. She barricaded herself into her room. She wasn't eating. She was purging. She was cutting. And she was drinking. So, you know, all of that there. And etiology, the prevalence of patients with ED varies between 38 and 68%. The wide variety because of the reporting and actually the secrecy around reporting. The higher prevalence has been reported in patients of bulimia nervosa and anorexia binge type than anorexia nervosa restrictive type. Again, secrecy. Possible common factors are impulsivity. We see that a lot with the BN and the mixed ED. Obsessive compulsive traits, dissociation, funny one dissociation, because they almost use dissociation as a form of alternative relief for cutting. I actually have a patient in the ward right now who's been, she's 50 odd, she's been cutting most of her life, and we have her on the ward for a DBT program and she can't actually cut. So what she's doing is dissociating as a compensatory mechanism for not being able to cut. It's actually quite frightening because she's there and the next moment she's not. Mm -hmm. And she's actually not there. For periods of time, it can go for several hours initially, but now thankfully it's a little bit better. Trauma, again, this patient this morning was abused by her brother, trauma, and I'm sure a lot of you as addiction therapists see a hell of a lot of trauma, that's what you do, that's what it's based upon. High conflict in family environment, and you'll see all three cases I'm presenting have had conflict. Again, this makes sense in ED because family therapy is one of the mainstays of ED, particularly in the younger cohort. And then sensitivity to cultural trends. Again, the media, um, cultural trends in terms of social cultural trends, cultural trends as well in terms of background cultural trends. I mean, I'm going to say it, I'm Indian and, and for those of you who know about the Indian subculture, there is a lot of pressure on kids to do well. Kids to go into academics, kids go to medicine, engineering, law. Those are the three preferred professions and one of the cases here is and there's a lot of pressure from the family to go into one of these professions and you'll see this case earlier on, later on. Suicide. The findings report the high suicide rates among anorexia nervosa compared to individuals with bulimia nervosa whose rates don't appear to be as elevated. That is the worrying thing with anorexia nervosa. I talked about earlier, 20% of our patients will complete suicide with anorexia nervosa, particularly the restricting type. Frightening, frightening number to hear. So NSSI is higher in bulimia nervosa and compared to 3 to 20 percent of anorexia nervosa. The impulsivity would be, be understandable. The parasuicide attempts and you know the NSSI would be more prevalent there. A clinical cohort study published by Bulick reported suicide attempts approximately in 17 percent of the anorexia nervosa population. Who has reported as the second highest cause of death in the clinical cohort EN? Obviously, the first being heart failure which goes without saying there as well. 
7.54% of AN restricting types reported one suicide attempt, whereas approximately between 20 30% of other AN types. I, th I thought about this, I looked at the study, because 7.4% I thought a little bit higher. <coughs> However, the 20 30% doesn't actually say that there's also comorbidity, most often substance misuse. Hence, again, suicide by misadventure, who knows? But they haven't actually talked about the comorbidity in the 20 to 30%, so we need to take account for that. BN. Studies indicate the number of completed suicides among BN appear to be low compared to AN, thankfully. Attempted suicides are more prevalent in BN compared to AN populations. Again, we talked about the impulsivity, the whole binge purge thing, the self-loathing. And the more recently published data found that one in three women who were diagnosed with BN had at least one suicide attempt. The diagnosis of BN in adolescence does appear to raise the risk of increased suicidality and self-harm, but that goes with most mental illnesses. Anything that's diagnosed younger, anything that's more pathological at a younger age, has a worse degree and a more severe degree of pathology, psychopathology, through a person's lifetime. I mean, they give us schizophrenia, for example. So the necessity of screening. Riaz et al. talked about the importance of routinely screening among women with ED seeking treatment for BPD and self-harm. And I mean, I can't tell you this. So one of the places I admit to is Prairie. I admit to several other places. But they have a DBT program, and a very good DBT program, actually. And it's, it's mind-boggling, actually, how many patients present with BPD have symptoms of ED. I've got about five patients in the BPD program there, the DBT program there. I think out of which the five, four have an ED, you know, and whether it's actually clinically diagnosed, you know, covertly or whether it's more overt because of the shame and the secrecy associated with it, it still exists there. BN appeared to be have significant mark of immediate life threatening behaviors and already high. We talked about that. And significantly greater proportion of bulimia, self harm and bulimia had more reported more recent suicidal ideation engaged in self-harm behaviors during treatment <coughs> and attempted suicide. So again, case three comes into DBT, comes into skills group that morning in the car, cutting herself while she's driving. There you go. And you manage that. Wagnertel revealed extremely obese patients. So BM, we're talking about morbidly obese, not even talking about clinically obese. My nurses usually laugh at me because I don't actually use the word obese. I use the word adipose because I think it's just a more appropriate word to use and less stigmatizing for patients. So I would say clinically adipose patients had a prevalence rate of suicidal behavior 33% of females and 13% of males. And then the NSSI was 28% in females and 13% in males. However, 19 to 59% have a lifetime prevalence of one suicide attempt. Again, the number there is quite a wide variety, but that hasn't taken into account for comorbidity. And there's a lot of comorbidity, as you'll see in one of my cases, with people with binge eating disorder. So other factors that could also influence positively the relationship between ED and self-injurious behavior, so actually perhaps further it, would be depression, impulsivity, OCD, affective dysregulation, dissociation, Criticizing self-style need for control. Again, we talked about that in AN, the need for control in a world gone mad, that perfectionistic personality, that anxious, high-achieving personality, the person, that, that girl, that the first daughter, the older daughter with successful parents who wants to get it right. A friend of mine, actually, in Galway, on the side, there was a private uh, mental health facility for adolescents, tin-bedded mental health facility for adolescents. And uh, all the, the 10 girls then were in for AN or mix, mixed ED. A friend of mine actually did a study. All 10 girls, uh, no, nine girls, their parents were barristers, both of them, and one of them was a barrister and a solicitor. There was a study done on this, actually. So you're thinking about kids who come from high-pressure environments with this perfectionistic style. You're actually talking about a <coughs> recipe, possible recipe for disaster. Again, previous suicidal behaviors and attempts goes without saying very, very, very high risk. Other factors, association with ED and self-injury among people in history of trauma and abuse, including verbal, emotional neglect, physical, sexual, and substance abuse. You talk about, in all my cases actually today, there is an element of neglect. And I was thinking about that, neglect, and again, in one of the cases, sexual abuse. This morning as well, this crisis I had this morning, there's also a history of sexual abuse there. It's not the most severe the eating disorder pathology, the higher risk of self-injury is. 
again, all those factors about in there, do I like myself? I hate myself. I hate life's not worth living. It's that tripartite of I'm not good, the world is not good, that my future is not good. So treatment options. A study by Frisch et al. noted that people who are DBT post-treatment has significantly reduced self-harm, reduced frequency of objective binges and frequency of purging. Now there's DBT and there's DBT. In the program I worked with in Dublin, there's a cycle of DBT actually lasted two years. So okay, we couldn't take in as many people, but our results were very good because we had people in, in therapy with a named therapist for two years, doing skills groups, doing one-to-one -one groups, having phone contracts with their therapist, individual therapists for two years. So actually, the results we got were very, very positive. In the study, the global eating disorder scale were also much lower for the individuals in DBT. And follow-up studies, participants in the study were several participants, they didn't actually say how many, and I did notice that. However, three were absent of binge eating after completely completing the DBT program. And I've actually, I actually had a patient in about a year ago who's a binge eater, and I put her to DBT. And frankly, between that and OA, she's actually done fantastically well, because in binge eating, what you see is the emotional dysregulation. So the binge happens because of self-soothing. And then they start binging because they're self-soothing. And it works because their, their cognition about themselves, their self-concept is so low. And I found that this particular individual did fantastically well because she had the support of OA. She had a sponsor, which is something you all of you as addiction therapists understand the power of. So she had someone as a go-to person. And it's actually done really, really well and continues to do well. It's back working, living on her own, and it's actually living a very functional life with a reasonably normal BMI, actually, and bloods. So Robinson et al. showed that mentalized-based uh, treatments have an impact on core body image, psychopathology, and BPD services. This is the Nourish study that's actually still ongoing. The results are still in the process of being formulated because the study is still ongoing. I think it's actually at the Maudsley. And there are several consultant psychiatrists who are actually involved in this study who I know of. But there is definitely some good evidence to show that mentalized behavior treatments are of an impact on core body image. Other treatment options include access to crisis management systems, individual therapy, skills training, and therapist consultation teams. What I haven't actually mentioned is also the Maudsley is doing the Tiara study. Has anyone heard of the Tiara study? It's using RTMS, which is, uh, actually has some very, very good results for affective states and on people with eating disorders. I recently actually had, and that's why I wanted no press here, I had a young doctor come in to me, a young junior doctor with chronic anorexia and self-harm, who's actually been a participant in the study. She has also been into DBT, which has really helped, but she has chronic anorexia and a BMI of about 16, and has been 16 for a long, long time, despite two pregnancies. And the RTMS definitely impacted on her mood. In terms of where we are in terms of eating disorders, I think there's still work to be done. I think there's positively good work to be done, but there are more studies that are needed. But for people who feel that they are lost causes, she's I'm the third psychiatrist she came to actually, looking for an opinion, and I had to say, look, I am constrained within what I can do in, 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 a, in a clinic. You need to be community health services where you have a clinical nurse specialist, you have a name dedicated CPN, you have a name dedicated therapist for DBT, you need a team around you, you need to build a scaffolding around you. It is very, very hard and that was actually a hard day because I woke, I drove home that day thinking, this is a young woman, she's a young mother, a two-year-old and a, well, a three-year-old and a one-year-old, thinking this girl is possibly going to be dead in the next five years and I went to, thought to myself, how do I feel about that? And it's, I think, something we need to reconcile as therapists and as doctors. How do we feel about this and understanding where our limitations are, knowing that we're not God, knowing that this is what we can do, this is the best advice we can offer. And I just said, look, my ego isn't big enough to say I can treat you because I can't. Not in this setting, not with the services I have in private medicine. You need a community team around you. And I think it's about calling that. It's, it's difficult for us as caregivers. But... It's about, I think, part of it is accepting where our limitations are. I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. Just thinking she's not going to be around the next five years. Anyway, on with that was an aside. In conclusion, eating disorders, specifically anorexia nervosa, is associated with higher rates of completed suicide, especially in the context of BPD. We talked about that. 
Self-injurious behaviours result in frequent in ED with higher rates among ED because that include binge purge behaviours. So in the binge purge, the impulsive type behaviour, you see the more parasuicide type attempts. And self-injurious behaviours, which may or may not include suicidal intent, are especially high in adolescents with ED. I was going to actually bring this up very slightly. I have a lot of younger patients, a lot of kids, girls in school doing their A-levels. Now, schools changed when I was in school, you know. They, the course of self-harm and ED is so prevalent in schools. Lots of the schools that I've actually talked to, and I've actually lectured in a few schools with students, have actually had programs for identifying ED, identifying self-harm. But it's frightening in how many schools, I'm talking across the board, private, public, state, whatever, where ED is acknowledged and, and self-harm is acknowledged, but kids don't seek help because the shroud of shame and secrecy that they hide under, they, they know, they know the cutters in their class, they know the people who are anorexics, they know the bulimics in their class, but they won't talk about it because the shame, and I think it's up to, up to all of us, as therapists, as doctors, as GPs, to destigmatize and say, actually, it is okay to say you need help. You are not horrible. You're actually really, really lovely, and you're really special, and you're really brave. And I'm so glad you've come to me, and I can help you. Let's work on this together. Any questions? Okay, let's go. Oh. Um, your statistics would show uh, the prevalence of the um, from eating disorders into self-harm. Yeah. Self-harm into <coughs> It's hard to say because it hasn't the studies I looked at haven't they've always talked about comorbidity in the context of something else, in the context of depression, in the context of trauma. So I would say around the same, but I there's no clear cut studies about that. Because again, you saw the comorbidity level there. So it's the water's kind of muddy to try and actually see a clear, more clear-cut picture. You'll see it through my case studies as well. There's a lot of comorbidity there as well. It, it's on the spectrum, again. There's nothing very... As I say, we all work in shades of grey, and things <coughs> are on the spectrum. Okay, so case study A. 21-year-old girl, first presentation to a psychiatrist. She was actually brought to me by her local guardian, and you'll see why, Who's who actually um, has the power of attorney for her in terms of... Cause until she was 18 and now that she's a major is still there and is a bit of a surrogate mother to her. This lady and this girl, this lady's daughter and this girl are actually best of friends. That's how she came to me. So I'm worried about my mental state. It's having an effect on my physical state and this is quite important. I think I have severe eating disorder. I've been unwell for four and a half years, so about 16, 16 and a half. The patient reports that she eats emotionally, eats anything that is available, almost goes into a trance when she eats, steals food. This is quite important because she lives as a lodger with people. And this is not the first time that people have said they steal food. Again, it's about the shame and the secrecy associated with needy. Thinks about food between 50 and 90% of the day. I'm sure for all of you who have patients with ED, a lot of them have gone into chefing. I have patients who's training in Cordon Bleu. They are excellent cooks. They're constantly thinking about food, talking food about food, making food. It's in their mind the whole time. It's like an addict, actually, with all of you addiction therapists. Alcohol or a substance is always there. It's always there. Okay, the last binge purge was in the morning of the assessment that she came to see me. She tries to binge on health foods. And this is why I talked about the orthorexia and all that kind of clean eating phenomenon. So she binges on things like quinoa and frica. But a binge is still a binge. And it's not so much the food itself, the actual food but it's the process that happens behind the binge. So, I mean, you can binge on Frika and soy milk milkshakes, you know, but it's still a binge. Purges every single time she binges. I was actually taken aback. Three to 10 times a day over the last four and a half, five years. And she uses weight loss as a form of control. And I'll tell you why a little bit, but again, we see this why, but this is very important for this girl. She uses her body image as a matter of she, whether she's achieved something or not. An achievement in this girl's life has really been a problem. She's really struggled, and we look at that in the academics. She's used laxatives between the age of 16 and 18. At the age of 18, she started binging and purging. She weighs herself <coughs> six to 10 times a day. Beyond just even you know trying to get, to, you know, get through your day, it must take an awful lot of time having to keep going weighing yourself. 
Anyway, she cuts herself to relieve tension, and that's my point early on. Why do you cut yourself? Do you cut yourself to relieve tension? Do you cut yourself as a cry for help? Or do you cut yourself to kill yourself? She cuts her thighs when she's feeling out of control or frustrated with herself for binging. She's previously used it as a cry for help. I started cutting age 14 when dysregulated, when her emotions were all over the place, and she didn't have the tools or the wherewithal to express her dysregulation. This resulted in her dissociating, and this is something we see a lot, the dissociating resulting in emotional dysregulation. She's cut herself superficially with suicidal intent in the past, and again, this always worries me. What is the intent you hurt yourself with? Is the intent as a cry for help when you happen to severe an artery, or is the intent to kill yourself when you take five paracetamol? The intent is always the worrying thing. And as a psychiatrist, when I'm doing a risk assessment, I always think about the intent. And the anecdote I always give is when I was a junior doctor, I went to I was in liaison psychiatry, and this is in Dublin, and I went to see a young lad who had taken an overdose, and he had like two bottles of vodka, and I think taken about 50 milligrams of diazepam. And he woke up, and he said, I said, I'm a doctor, I'm here to see you. He's like, oh, what sort of doctor? I said, I'm a psychiatrist. He said, I'm not mad. I need a dentist. I had a toothache. I took all that because I had a toothache. So his intent was a toothache. <laughs> but I said, you had enough to fell a horse and kill yourself. But his intent was genuinely for a toothache, nothing else. He was mentally very well. So intent is very much what you need to assess and actually evaluate what, when you're actually assessing somebody. She's thought about planning a suicide many times. Again, very worrying. And as a child, she used to bang her head on the wall. So this behavior has been going on for a long time. She said she used the self-harm as a distraction for the physical pain to override the emotional pain. That's what we talked about earlier on. The physical pain to almost express the emotional pain because lots of these kids aren't given the tools or given the validation as a young child to actually express emotional need, emotional distress, or have their needs met. So because a lot of them, you'll see, when there's trauma at a younger age and needs aren't met, they don't actually have the tools to express this trauma or express what they're distressed about. So, her psychosocial stressors, she's had two terminations. She said she never used contraception because she was amenorrheic because of an eating disorder. And her mother passed away suddenly following an RT, a road traffic accident. Then up and down relationship, she had a mother with a wicked temper and was verbally abusive. What she specifically said to me, she said she was a trodden down dog and her mother was a cruel owner who used to kick her dog. I thought it was a really, really awful way to describe a mother-daughter relationship. And I've never heard anything so graphic, I think. Past medical surgical history, two terminations, and of course they both went wrong. So poor girl hemorrhage post her first termination. I'm talking serious hemorrhaging here. She was actually transfused several pints of blood. And then of course the second termination was an incomplete evacuation. So then she had to go re wheeled into surgery last minute again as emergency surgery for adaptation and curatage, which I don't know if any of you know, it's actually a really traumatic procedure and it's quite invasive. Again, it's under GA, which brings its own problems. She's had two admissions to general wards post alcohol binges as well. She passed out, knocked her head, vomiting, one time vomited blood. Her parents got divorced when she was four years old. It was a very, very acrimonious relationship. She was sent off to boarding school and then lived with her mother, older brother. Sorry, older brother has Asperger's and the younger brother's an angry person. So very difficult familiar relationships. Growing up with these two kids as well, couldn't have been easy. Already difficult relationship with mum and dad. Substance misuse, denied smoking cigarettes, not drinking alcohol, as does not like the feeling of being out of control. Previously used a few drugs. But again, the out of control bit is the bit that she doesn't like. So drugs really weren't her thing. And substances. Been with her boyfriend for three years. She lived with her boyfriend's family, almost as a lodger. So he's away in university, and she lodges with them for free, but she says she does things such as cooking, teaching the younger child, buying groceries, tidying up after dinner. Again, a lot of food-related activities she does for the family. She was asked to leave university after one year due to poor academic performance. Now this was harrowing for her to admit to me. The shame she said, she goes, I've never said this to anybody. Everybody thinks I left because I wanted to pursue my modeling career. Um, but I was actually asked to leave. She goes, I can't get over the shame. My parents were so bright. I come from a very, very bright family and I was asked to leave. Again, the shame that this girl feels. Models to earn a living. This girl is beautiful. I can't tell you how beautiful she is. 
And of course, so much of her self-identity, her self-image is tied up with the way she looks. Her loathing of herself is tied up with the way she looks. It's hard for her because she spends her life being photographed, being judged in this very, very difficult cutthroat industry. She's only 21 and there's not been much parental guidance and she's in this industry with this illness. It's actually quite frightening hearing about how vulnerable she is. People talk to her about the way she looks. It's not even how are you, it's like you look beautiful today or you know, how come you don't look as good today? It's all about judgment. No wonder she loathes herself. Case study, any questions about case study A before I move on? Okay, case study B. So she's a 21-year-old woman returning to a psychiatrist, recently, also previously seen in camps. I've suffered depression my whole life and through my teens. She reported that she cries every day, has poor attention, concentration, and focus. Her mood started to deteriorate a year ago, progressively self-isolating and withdrawing, difficulties with sleeping and early morning awakening, poor energy levels, and poor motivation. So in the face of it, yeah, possibly depressed, mild moderate depressive episode, poor attention and concentration, moods that are deteriorating, slow progression. Okay, it's reasonably straightforward. However, she goes mood days without eating, gets very conscious of eating in public. This is something you'll see people with ED talk about a lot. They hate eating in public. They are terrified. They feel judged. They feel embarrassed. They feel ashamed of themselves. They feel they don't deserve to eat in public. They feel they don't deserve to eat. But eating in public is a nightmare. Gets hungry before bedtime and binges up to 5,000 calories. Now, the average recommended daily amount for a woman is 2,000 and a man, an average sized woman with reasonable activity, and a man is 2,200. She eats almost up to three times what a woman needs per day. She has gotten up at night and driven to McDonald's, not one time, not two times, but three times in the course of a night. In the, the middle of the McDonald's drive throughs that open all night. She's gone three times. Why does somebody get any sleep if they go three times a night? She feels she cannot stop when she starts binging. It's that compulsiveness, it's that, that out of controlness that she, when she starts binging. She just goes on and on and on. She describes herself as going into a trance and uses it to self-soothe, but so when she dysregulates, it's almost like a dissociation where she binges as a dissociative activity. And she just keeps the food, just keeps going in and out, in and out. She denied the history of purging, restricting, use of laxatives, antidiuretics, and her BMI was 28. Now this is after she lost some weight, so her BMI is a little bit higher, but a good bit higher before that. Suffered like self-harming age 15 years using razors and other sharp objects. She cuts her arms to relieve tension. Again, why do you cut? Age 16 and 17, she tried to kill herself. An actual suicidal intent here. Again, left a note on the first occasion, which is again very, very worrying. A note for her mother to say goodbye. And continues to cut when stressed or after arguments. And I'm going to talk about arguments because there are a lot of those. Psychosocial stresses. Acrimonious divorce to parents age 12 years old. Really, <coughs> really difficult. Father moved out suddenly and she had no contact with him for years. So when she was 12, I think up to about 17, she had no contact with dad. He cut her off. He just behaved like he was dead to her. Age 17, her mother decided she should move to her father's place for, to be cl closer to school. And I kid you not, she lived with her dad for two years and he didn't say a word to her the whole time. So she'd come down the stairs and he'd go up the stairs and he kind of turned his back to her and he kind of woke up the stairs. At dinner time, there's no past salt. He just ate and he left. This man didn't talk to her. Now, I know he's autistic, and I'll talk about that. He didn't talk to her. What sort of molding does a child get at that point, particularly at such a young age? She feels she's underachieved through her life, and her mom compares her to her high-achieving cousins. This is what I was talking about earlier on with the cultural trends, and she's saying, I'm Indian, so I can say it. She is of an Indian background, and cousins are in med school, cousins are in law school. This kid is struggling through university, and her mom keeps comparing her to these cousins because in these communities, to be of value, you are <coughs> in certain professions and professional lines. I'm allowed to say that, so, because I am Indian. Okay. okay, so, going on. Clinical adiposity, I was talking about adiposity earlier, <coughs> so I used the word adiposity. Gromit is a child, and I thought about this, I did ask her, I said, did this affect you? Did this affect your confidence because your hearing was affected? She said, yeah, it sort of did because I always thought I was stupid. And initially, the teachers thought I was stupid because I couldn't really hear in class. 
School, so school counselor age 14, diagnosed with depression age 15, commenced with citalopram, stopped medication, saw another camp psychiatrist, didn't follow up. Lot of co uh, family history. So it's schizophrenia and suicide, which is always a worrier because if there's a family with suicide, the risk of suicide, completed suicide in the patient is always higher. Dad suffers depression and is autistic, hence some of those very strange interpersonal, social and nonverbal behaviors that dad has. But dad is quite severely autistic. Mom is a doctor. Uh, relationship with mom is very, very enmeshed. Um, they used to come to my office and they used to shout at each other. And mom says, she's so, look at her, she's so useless, she's fat, she sits there, she eats. Then mom, on the same token, would hug her and kiss her and cry and say, oh, my, you're my darling girl, I'll do everything for you, I'll help you, let me, let's work this together. So that's just a family therapy. And mom said, no, no. I'm a doctor, the shame, I cannot do this. You really feel like you're stuck here, and you're trying to do something, but you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Dad texts once a month, which is, Better than usual. I said, how do you react to that? She goes, I don't really think about it. I just delete his texts. There's, a, there's not much bonding there as well. So substance is not really an issue for this girl. But I suppose food is her substance if you think about it. Oh, sorry. Any questions about <coughs> this girl? Binge eating and self-harm. Not as much as we see in the usual sort of EDs, but I thought it'd be interesting to bring a binge eater here and see what she has. The one thing you'll notice in all three cases, and I was actually thinking about this as well, is the parental relationships. And just perhaps it's because of all these three cases that I've chosen. The parental relationships are usually ended up in acrimonious divorces and very difficult parental relationships. So very difficult for a child to model appropriate relationships and appropriate expression of distress when you see parents arguing in such acrimonious relationships where expression of distress is screaming, shouting, or sulking as well. I was just thinking about that and thinking how this ties into all these girls. Okay, so the next one's 28 year old woman returning to psychiatrist. I'm really struggling with... What's the kind of self harm that you would do? Which one, this girl? No. The binge eater? No. The cutting. Cutting with razors, sharp objects, knives, uh, cutting to relieve tension, cutting to self-soothe, cutting when dysregulated. Superficial cutting, yeah, not not too bad. Forearms. Forearms and thighs and abdomen. Don't forget, big abdomen. Also, quite frighteningly, under her breasts, because she had she was a large girl, so cutting under her breasts because it couldn't be seen, and it hurt. It hurt because of the chafing. It hurt a lot more, so healing took much longer. So I know, going in once when you know the GP saw her, there was actually a nightmare cleaning the wounds. Any other questions? About case B. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, it depends on the case, but I, th I suppose with her, it is what she uses to paper over trauma, and that's what. Again, in her case, I would say she's addicted to food, but it's not a continuum of, of grayness. So yes, it is her substance, and that's what she uses as an addict uses alcohol or cocaine to, to paper over their trauma. She uses food to paper over trauma for the exact same reasons a substance misuse addict would use a substance. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So going on to the third case, and that's probably why with uh, Overeaters Anonymous works so well for a lot of these patients, as I was telling you about my other girl with DBT and OA, she did so well because the same model as an AA, NA, CA, you have the sponsor, you have the 12 steps, OA works really, really well for these patients because they view food as a substance. So yeah, that is, you are right. Okay, moving on to case C. She's actually quite complex, I'll tell you a lot more about her. I'm really struggling with my moods. My moods are extreme, I have extreme changes and they can be changed within hours. I used to self-harm to relieve tension, and now I purge three, three or four times a day. I feel very empty. Again, what do we see in borderline personality difficulties? And I always call it difficulties because I think disorder is a misnomer because it's not really a disorder. It's not like, here, take a course of Kephrosporin for five days and, you know, your chest infection is better. I can't cure it. I can't give you an SSRI and alleviate it. So it's, it's a variance of personality. And I, I just think calling a disor disorder 
isn't that entirely fair to the patient? Whereas if you actually say it's a difficulty, you, you suffer, where you have, what I tell patients, you have thin emotional skin. It's actually a lot more validating for people because they realize, you know what, I'm struggling. And someone understands, and someone hears I'm struggling. It's not me, I'm not unwell, but this is very real stuff that I'm struggling with that manifests in ways that I can't always understand. But I know there's help out there. It gives them a real, actually using that word of difficulty compared to disorder gives a real message of hope to people. And I think hope is so important because it underpins everything we do. As caregivers, it's about hope. Okay, so moving on. The patient reported that she's been taking antidepressants for the last two years, and little effect, and quel surprise. You know, people go with their primary care physicians, they're dysregulated, they're feeling low, I'm feeling upset, I'm feeling low, no motivation. It can very often mimic a depressive disorder, and yes, indeed, you can have depressive symptoms when you dysregulate, you <coughs> even have an episode of depression, so her GP, in all good faith, gave antidepressants. But in dysregulation, it's to minimal effect. She suffers poor sleep patterns with early morning wakening and ruminations, constantly exhausted with poor motivation, fear of emotional intensely. Do you remember I was talking about thin emotional skin? So I always tell my patients, I always tap myself. I say, for myself, <coughs> I feel it that deep. For you, and this is our emotional skin. For you, you feel it that deep. For me, I forget about it in a second. For you, I keep thinking about it, thinking about it, and thinking about it pressure builds in you. For me, you know, I move on. And for you, it stays with you. And that pressure builds, and that pressure builds, and that pressure builds, until somebody, you try to explain it to somebody, and they don't get it. And then you just want to get it out. You want to get it out. And you just think, get it out, get it out, get it out. Almost to get it out, you almost have to get it out physically. If you sometimes hurt yourself. You scream, you shout, you hurt. But you think, yeah, that's it the pressure builds, that pressure builds. If you talk to any of your patients with borderline personality difficulties, you talk about on DBT, you talk about the contingency management, you talk about how you put in the contingency management as the pressure builds. Before they actually self-harm, you use the self-soothing skills, you use your skills, you use your distress tolerance, you use your interpersonal effectiveness. You come in before you actually hurt yourself. What I tell people a lot, go have a cold shower, it works. It actually works. It's a self-soothing mechanism, but it works for BPD. It works very effectively. So, uh, just going back, she feels emotions intensely, from zero to 100 in no time, and feels out of control a lot of the time. Again, that word control. She feels out of control. Her emotions are all over the place. She feels emotions. She says, Doctor, I can go from incredibly happy, top of the world, doing brilliantly at work, to near suicidal on my bedroom floor in a matter of hours. I feel out of control. What does she do to take back control? The ED comes in. It's intense fear of fatness, binge purge patterns of eating, and abuses laxatives and over exercises. The laxatives is very, very important in this case because it actually gets far, far more complex than just plain laxatives. And I'll talk about that as we go on. So, what is self harming age 15 years? Admitted to a CAMS unit for three weeks didn't really do much. Contained self-harming for that period, but didn't really do much. Again, CAMS being CAMS, the theory is that personality doesn't really form before 16. We see it. We see traits, but we see personality as plasticine. And the plasticine only hardens, theoretically, after 16. But the plasticine is still there. So thinking is changing, and people are actually going in a lot more early intervention with young adults. Uh, I used to work when I was first moved over here in an early intervention unit and actually they did DBT for young adults and it was actually very, very effective because by the time we got them into later adolescence, these kids were scaled up and actually could manage their self-harm and actually had really, really good results there. I used to run the skills group there. So you continue self-harming after discharge. She used to cut herself with sharp objects, hit her head against the wall or like this, <coughs> you're so dumb, you're so stupid, pull her hair usually self-harm secondary to emotional dysregulation. Stop cutting when she started actually working. She works in a law firm, which she could be seen by others, and now binge purges as a form of self-punishment. She comes into my office beautifully dressed in her suits, but you know, under the suits, she's scarred up and down her tummy area as well. 
Psychosocial stresses, again, parents separated when she was nine years old. I didn't actually happen to choose three cases of parents separated, it just happened to be. But I noticed this as a trend, again, an acrimonious separation. Mom is very emotionally and mentally abusive, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but mom is very invalidating. Mom doesn't believe in mental illness. It's about pulling yourself together and getting on with it and stop being silly. And I, I did bring mom in for a meeting with me, it's from psychoeducation, and it was horrifying, actually. Um, no relationship with father, second and third wife. Mom is the first wife, and she's estranged from dad. Dad lives in Spain with his third wife and his kids. Um, no relationship there, and he left when she was quite young. This is very, very important. So she has a history of endometriosis, gut dysmotility syndrome, and diagnosed with depression at age 15 years. She's trialed on fluoxetine diazepam, stopped medication two years later. The endometriosis and the gut dysmotility syndrome. She has very, very severe endometriosis. She is on a marina coil for medicinal purposes. She is, let's say, 28. She's had four laparoscopies through her lifetime. And I, I was talking to her gynecologist, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. If women are unlucky, you'll have one lap. She's had four in her 28 years. That's somewhat pathological. Gut dysmotility syndrome. This actually, we bought, I talked to the to the gastro, and this girl's actually got double whammy. She's got a she's got a tight esophageal sphincter, so up here, and the other side where her gut is actually quite slow, and this is not actually part of her ED. Is that she was actually born with gut dysmotility syndrome, so she's actually on a regimen of various medications, which I'll talk about, because the laxative is actually quite important in this case. Um. Family history, mom suffers alcohol dependence syndrome, strong, strong history of ADS and the maternal family, grandparents, aunts, cousins, really, really strong. Maternal grandfather suffers depression and schizophrenia as well as ADS. Two paternal half-sisters suffer, but so dad's other daughters suffer bulimia and anxiety. Mom has never admitted that she has a problem. I think only in the last month has started seeing a therapist, but mom let's put it this way, this young kid, when she was young, used to put mum to bed, came home, gave up college to look after mum because mum was not functioning, not eating, not leaving the house. There was neglect. She smokes and drinks and binge patterns two to three times a week and drinks up to 60 units per week. This is actually minimizing it a little bit. I had her in hospital as a, as a kind of crisis management and I discharged her last week in the DBT program as an outpatient. And the day she actually discharged, she said, look, Dr. Gerswami, I think I have a problem with alcohol. I said, I think you do. On one weekend ski trip, but it was a long weekend, I think four or five days, she drank about 120 units through the whole weekend. But she would drink about closer to 18 units a week. A bit more sometimes. And one gram of cocaine and binge pattern every few months. Which is interesting because, again, you're being out of control with alcohol, uh, but you're in control, so to speak, with your ED. So I want to talk about this case, actually. She, I actually called an interdisciplinary consultant conference for her because she, she came into my, one, my clinic one day in acute pain with an acute abdomen. So I examined her. The girl had an acute abdomen. She was septic. She was telling me that there was fecal material coming out of her vagina and thought, shit, fistula with endometriosis. So I packed her off to casualty. And she was kept in overnight and then let go. And then she went to see her, I made her go see her gynae because I thought it was an endometriosis. The gynae then wrote back to me saying her endometriosis is okay because she actually has a marina. So then she went to see her gastro and the gastro said, well, he's, he's got her an a regimen of laxatives. So then I called all the consultants together and her DBT therapist and actually went to nurses on the ward. I said, look, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Let's talk about this. So the gastroenterologist did not know the Chen ED. She did not tell him. So there he was, filling her full of Dulcolax, Senna, Picolax, Enemas, <laughs> for the gut dysmotility syndrome. She didn't tell him. And she was also minimizing the alco alcohol. She was pushing the gynecologist to take out the marina. Now this girl, the gynecologist subsequently told me that the marina was the only way to keep her safe and stable. But she hadn't told the gynecologist she'd seen four other gynecologists in the past and at one point had two marina coils, in, which is crazy. I mean, she obviously went and told what, a GP or a gynae that I need a marina. They put it in. 
showed to another GP a guy and he said, I need marina. They put it in. Nobody has two marina coils. That's pathological. So there's all this other stuff going on. Then she tried telling me, giving me symptoms of ADHD. And she, you know, because obviously you hear about concerta, methamphetamine, dexamphetamine, killing your appetite. And I'm thinking, uh uh, this isn't happening. We're not going down this route. So I called all the professionals together to say, what is going on with her? And it's actually quite a revelation because the gynae obviously didn't know things, the gastro didn't know things. And all of this was shrouded. There was the secrets going on with everybody, but all of this was shrouded in shame. Again, so, so ashamed of her ED. Self-harm because of all the, the dysregulation. And I remember when I told her about organizing this, this meeting, she just started shouting and saying, you're cornering me, you're cornering me, you're trying to trap me. And I thought, I said, very strange response to give me when I'm trying to organize all the health, mental health, the physical health, mental health professionals to help you. And then she came back to me and said, you know, you said what you said to me? I started dysregulating, I cut, and I binge, and I binge, and I purge, and I purge, because of what you said. But she realized that actually she'd been, you know, telling different people different stories. And it was actually interesting about her because she almost presented like a Munchausen's. Because the gastro then said to me, she shouldn't have come into impact. She came into impacted. That's why I had to casualty twice. Because he had an erosion with a laxative. So she actually wasn't taking her laxatives so she could be physically sick. And the gynae said that she wanted her marina out, which would actually destabilize her endometriosis. And what would happen then is she'd get physically sick and be validated by mum. This is the only way this girl gets any nurturing attention and care from mum. Because as we know, mum said mental illness does not, does not exist. So we're not going to go down the mental illness way. So, what does she do? She gets herself physically ill, in and out of hospital. The only way that mum gives her the attention and says, poor girl, my poor darling, you know, you're unwell. And this actually then came out in the meeting. And it was interesting how we had to try and hold her, validate her need to be heard, but also help her not pathologize herself, physically or mentally, in a way that, was, that she felt supported and safe by saying, well, what you're suffering is very real. You know, you are in pain, physically and mentally. We need to stabilize things. We need to stabilize your physical health. We need to stabilize your mental health. We need to actually get you held in therapy with a dietitian to see you. But the scaffolding around you. And I, I'm constantly going on about scaffolding. I was talking about the other patient this morning. Get the dietitian in, get the therapist in, get the GP in, get as many people to provide the expertise we need. Get the family therapist in, get the couples counsellor in, get whoever you need in, because as mental health professionals, we need to manage risk, we need to hold risk, we hold it together. It's, it's crazy to think that one of us has to hold risk by ourselves. And that, this morning as well, I called the GP and I said, look to the GP, I don't think it's fair that you and I should hold risk by ourselves. I don't think it's safe and I think we're going to be negligent to this lady to hold risk this ourselves. We have to call the community mental health team, we have to get the AMP involved. We have to get a CPN involved because we will be doing her a disservice by just trying to hold risk ourselves. And again, with this kid, it's about holding her risk. And now we have her back into DBT. We have her seeing the various therapists. We have her seeing the various consultants. In fact, her consultant called me, this girl, yesterday saying, where is she? She hasn't turned up for a clinical appointment. But the consultants have each other's mobiles now, so we actually are in constant contact, which really keeps things much safer and much tighter for her. So hopefully there's hope. I know I think I think there's hope, but it's just a question of holding her and telling her that she's actually worth it and her distress is real and we hear it. I think that's the most important thing about all these patients, telling them we hear their distress, we believe it, they're not going mad, and we are gonna help as much as we can. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for uh, a lot of what you've said resonated with me, particularly the attachment issues, early dysfunctional family, you know, problems that reflect later on. I, I come across that all the time, the con element of control. But what, I, what I, I, I'm interested in is, you know, obviously as a ther I'm a therapist, is dealing with this. So in terms of treatment, one of the things that I come across a lot is the comorbidity we were talking about before. Now, let's say it's substance abuse. Do you work concurrently with the substance abuse and the eating disorder, or do you deal with them in, in two discrete ways? I think it's advisable, and the therapist can correct me over here as well, I think it's advisable to deal with one at a time. Yeah. So as a, as a psychiatrist, I look at what is the 
the pathology that presents the most danger here and now. So we deal with that pathology first, <coughs> and then we deal with the next pathology. So for example, this morning, first thing this morning, again, another patient, I was going to bring her up. She's a pregnant lady, and oh, she's not, she's postpartum, and her son is 12 weeks old. She's got PND. She has borderline personality difficulties, She's starting to attend the DBT program today, as of today, and is a self-harmer. She self-harms more superficially, scratches herself, kind of cuts herself superficially. She had a very, very traumatic birth and quite a traumatic uh, pregnancy. Very, very dysfunctional relationship with her parents, incredibly so. Husband who's somewhere else, not there, just unconnected to her. And she, by virtue of the, 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 the traumatic birth, she has to have some psychosexual work done. And she asked me, what should I have in St. George's? And I said, well, look, the DBT stuff is right now what we need. We need to try and help the emotional regulation because you're dysregulating and you're the sole care of a 12-month-old. Afterwards, when we've had the program and treated you with and given you some skills, let's go do the psychosexual stuff. So I will always go with clinical need first. I mean, the reason I say that is because very often what I've observed in my practice is that, you know, if someone comes in for alcoholism or for, you know, other forms of substance abuse, very often once you start to work on that and it starts to, to clear up or you start to work through it, I'm then the eating out. disorder reveals I'm itself. I know, you know, all the time. And so I would say, again, let's be safe. Let's go for the stuff that presents the most harm imminently, and then we'll start dealing with the, pain, the, uh, the fallout, so to speak. So, for example, this girl this morning, I called the Mental Health Act Assessment. The first thing is to get her safe. Get her into a unit where she's safe. She can't hurt herself. She can't cut herself. She can't headbang. Let's do that. Obviously, she needs to be sober. Once we get her there, get her held. Look at her BMI, because she has actually been restricting, restricting, restricting. Rehydrate her. Let's just do the practicalities. Let's get a line into her if we need to. Let's make sure her ECG is stable. Once all that's stable, you know, and she's, she's, she's contained, and she, there's fluids going into her, let's look at the alcohol then. Once we look at the alcohol, then let's look at the ED. <coughs> but it's about doing, do, as, as we doctors say, do no harm first. I, sorry, I, I just another question sure. about control, you know? Because what, one of the things is that in, the, in terms of actual the treatment of uh, people with eating disorders, one of the problems is that, you know, that they, they're going to try and take control, yeah. you know? So, at the same time, it, it, they have to take responsibility for themselves because they're never going to get better. And that fine balance between control and taking responsibility as a therapist is very difficult. How do you, how do you see that in you know, the day-to-day -day treatment of an eating disorder? My favorite it's a, word. Sorry, it's a difficult question. It, it is, it is. And I, I was thinking what I, I would do personally. I suppose my favorite word in the English language is boundaries. Boundaries. And understanding your own boundaries and putting boundaries for your patient. I genuinely believe as human beings, we all thrive with boundaries. People with borderline personality difficulty positively need them. But as well with eating disorders, it's about you are the patient, you are in recovery, you are not the therapist. So it's not for you to actually be the therapist and analyze yourself. It's for the therapist to do so. That is your boundary. But your responsibility as the patient is to look after yourself because your sole responsibility mm -hmm. is your safety, your body. And again, so it's, it's that fine balance about saying, yes, it's your responsibility. I'm not responsible for your safety. You are. I'm not responsible for the fact that you cannot keep yourself safe. You are. And I would always put that back to my borderline personality patients because I'm not responsible. I'm not responsible for you breathing. You are. You're responsible for that safety but I will give you the boundaries, and I will give you the help, and I will give you the containment as a doctor. So I'm very biological and very physiological in my approach because I have fantastic therapists I work with who deal with the psychological work. They say, all right, as a medic, I can look at your systems, I can look at your headspace, I can look at comorbidity, I can identify, we can identify need, we can establish trust, we can form the relationship, let's bring the therapist in, let the therapist start doing the work, let's, let's start doing the skill, you know, the skill training, Let's start doing the distress tolerance. Let's bring the dietitian because their expertise is necessary. And the way I put the dietitian to people is it's not about telling you what to eat. It's about nutrition. It's about combinations of vitamins, minerals, and nutrition in the correct combination so your brain works, so your heart works, so you can work, and you can actually do the psychological work. 
but boundary it's a combination of very fine balance of boundaries and responsibility. Does that answer your it question? Does, yeah, but it's very difficult, isn't it? It's incredibly difficult. Because at the moment you start talking about, you know, nutrition in terms of minerals because there's such control freaks then they start to get they can buy into that as but well. But that's why it's the boundary about the dietitian's job. You're not a dietitian. That's yeah. it. But you see where I'm coming from. You're a patient. Yeah. And again, it comes down to me to be a bad guy, which I usually am as a medic. You know, I'm the bad guy. You do not go down there. That is the nutritionist, the dietitian's role. You will take their advice and you will live within it within reasonable constraints. You will take responsibility for it, but you're not the professional. You are in recovery. So yeah, bad guy role works. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much for the talk. I may have had a failure of attention. I, I thought I heard you talk about cold showers. Yes. So a cold shower actually, believe it or not, it's actually a DVT technique. And it's very, very effective for people who are acutely dysregulating. So somebody who's literally feeling out of control and think they're going mad and they're going to hurt themselves, what you do, you tell them to go stand under a cold shower. The shock to the system actually shocks that, that acute need to hurt because physiologically, you've shocked the body into a response that it almost works as a non-harming, an adaptive distraction technique. And I'm talking about in extremis. There are other distraction techniques you can use. I have patients, my BPD patients won't call themselves soothing kits, feathers, squeezy balls, um, a little hymn or something, or a piece of poetry that they like, a picture of a, of a, a loved pet. These are a lot of distraction self-soothing techniques, but in extremis, cold showers, they actually work. The other thing that works again in acute dysregulation rather than actually hurting yourself, ice cubes. Cold ice cubes, so cold, they're not going to hurt you, but you're not thinking about hurting yourself. You're thinking about ice cubes. Really does work. Thank you for that. Uh, any more tips like that? That's <laughs> great. You know, all that stuff's welcome, you know. Chilies in the mouth. Chilies yeah. in the mouth. So yeah. sour, sweet. Yeah. Because this is great, isn't it? This mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, but this stuff really does work. And it's about what we can do to distract. Again, other self-soothing stuff. I mean, what works for the person? I'm not pro-pharmacology. So I would, I'm, as you know, a lot of people who work with me here know I'm not a fan of benzodiazepines. I do not go down that route. Because there's another whole host of problems there. So I would work with other self-soothing mechanisms. Depends, whatever it is. Whatever works for you. And I tell people the more we can do with mindfulness-based work, I tell all my patients have the Headspace app and the Budify app, <coughs> but the more you can do of that, and the more you get to use mindfulness, the better it is. I mean, I was saying to somebody this morning, I was using mindful, I was up at 4.16 this morning thinking, oh God, will everyone like my talk today? Will I have something to say? Will they get bored of me? So I was thinking, okay, let's just do some mindfulness. Let's just lie in bed and do some mindfulness. It does work. Include a lot of that, but you are right. I mean, there's some, there is some stuff that is worrying about eating disorders. I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard of Purana and Promia. Really, really worrying. You know, exchanging tips about how yeah. to, um, you know, how to lose weight, how to fool the medics. Yeah. Interestingly, I had a young NHS researcher, and that's why I wanted no press here because we we talk, you know, mental health is a small world, and people could know people, but. I had a young NHS researcher who was doing research in her, on her thesis on eating disorders and she had restrictive type anorexia. 
and she's from the Surrey walking area. So I think it's a day hospital in Farnham, the NHS hospital. And she's actually admitted there. And she, at that time, suffered quite severe anorexia, anorexia nervosa restricting type. But by virtue of working with all these patients, don't forget she was a researcher in this daycare unit, suffering AN herself. She, oh, very common. Uh, she came up to me, and she was my patient, came to see me as an outpatient for OCD, actually, not even for AN. And then the AN came out because it was an overwhelming thing. But uh, and she said, you know, I've worked in all these units. I know what to do. She's kept her BMI at 18, 17.9, 18.2 for most of her adult life, but her eating disorder is so deeply intracted, despite her BMI being at this, w at this point. She said, Dr. Kuraswamy, I know what to do. I know all the tricks. I've worked in eating disorder units. I'm a researcher. I know exactly how to fool all of you, and I will. She was a really, really difficult case, because again, another, another self-harmer, and she knew what to do, you know, and even the self-harm. Because she had a science background, she knew what to do. She knew where to cut. Well, it's almost that achievement level. Isn't oh, it really? absolutely. You, absolutely. Up, she's sitting there going, well, I, I can actually exclude all of these. Yep. The achievement to the validation that we yep. get from Yep, completely. Doing really good and the control. Time, she's getting it from that, really. The control, absolutely. Really, really difficult case to treat. Luckily, I have a very, very good therapist working with me on her. So, yeah, really difficult case to treat. Sorry, I still don't know. So, so to get back to your question, sorry, I got distracted. Yeah, it's all right, it's all right, yeah, um, the the results are mixed, you know, and I think it's their groups and their groups, and I think it's about attending somewhere that you know is, lack of a better word, pucker, you know. I mean, it's all very well saying you know, attending a community AN meeting, but who's chairing it? What's the expertise in it? Who's in it? what's the energy of the meeting as well. So something that's perhaps more mainstream through one of the main hospitals, one of the big organizations, is something a bit safer. Again, nothing for these patients, nothing beats individual therapy. So even if they're attending groups, I can't say enough how, my, how important individual therapy is and family therapy is. Frankly, I, as a psychiatrist, feel that family therapy is more important than group therapy, particularly restricting type AN. Any other questions? You talked about diet styles, and you mentioned the vegan diet. Yeah. And obviously, it's good for you to the mask. Very often. But what do you, do you consider the, what's the intrinsic merit or demerit of a vegan diet? My big issue, and this is my little crusade, is calcium and milk. You know, so, so the Chinese believe that we don't naturally drink milk. It's not no natural for the human being to drink cow's milk. We drink breast milk. But in eating disorders, the incidence and prevalence of osteopenia and osteoporosis, and as a result, the greater cost on the health service to all these little old ladies who break their hips, and then the high, high mortality rate due to pulmonary emboli, DVTs, you know, strokes, because of broken hips, is phenomenal. Women who don't need to die, die because of these complications. And again, for bone development, for teeth development, for brain development, for phosphorylation, for so many biological features in the body, calcium. So <coughs> in the vegan diet, my fundamental issue about it, particularly for young adults who are developing, is the lack of calcium in the vegan diet. I'm not if you're, if you're careful about it, if you're responsible about it, I have no issue. It's calcium. Again, it's just my interest in nutrition, but that is my kind of little crusade about it. And that's why what scared me at this meeting or at this course I went to, because there were a band of individuals who were, oh, no milk, no dairy. And I think, what kind of message is this to give our young people? No dairy, no milk. Mm -hmm. Do they understand the biological importance and the necessity for development? brain development, for eyesight development, bone development, just normal development of a calcium. You know, so that, that's my, I have no bones to pick with it, but just not for a vulnerable individual, and as well, I really do have ethical issues about a child who's still developing. Because I mean, organ growth happens, you know, you, could, you say you're a major at 18, but in a boy, organ growth goes on to about 23, and 
organ growth for a girl, so brains, hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, goes on to about 21. You know, the hormones are still adapting and settling down. You shouldn't mess with that. Do you find many cases of um, individuals coming in who actually have allergies to multiple foods? So um, allergies to the protein in cow's milk, plus egg allergy, wheat allergy, soy allergy, coming in. Coming in, sorry. They say they do. You know what? You can't. So my son had all of those, so which was so I think I'd be curious to know. Allergies do exist, absolutely. And again, being from the Indian subcontinent, we in later life develop a lactose intolerance. Mm -hmm. Can be overcome with lactase tablets, fine. I'd be devastated if I had to give up milk. But, you know, we, we could deal with that. Allergies absolutely do exist. And for example, in Ireland, there's a high where I, where I live, grew up, there's a high, high incidence of galactosemia, you know, because they lack galactase. So these things do exist. But we need to go right down the right channels. Mm -hmm. You know that whole fad for people saying, "Oh, it's I, I'm allergic to gluten." Yes, you can have you know inflammatory gl uh, gluten allergy, but not be per se you know gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is more evidence to that, and I hold up my hand and say that's absolutely fine. But if somebody is coming in with all these allergies and the mentality is about what's going on in there, because the EDs. It, not not your son, but an ED. Yes. It's about what's going on in here. It's about control. And by saying I have allergies, I think your antenna has to go up. I really, I just would always be careful. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else? What's the lowest weight? What's the lowest BMI that you just frequently across the Oh, how long is the piece of string? So the NHS. Used to be 14. The NHS now, I think, don't admit until it's 12 or lower. Yeah, 12. yeah so that, that's what the NHS is. But then again, we're talking about an overloaded, overstretched system. Frankly, my young researcher who had a BMI of 18.2, she should have been in hospital. She should have been in hospital long term, a good six months. You know, it's not so much BMI. Again, I keep coming back to it's not about your BMI, it's not about food. BMI is, is a measure of the illness, but it's how not... Much, how much of it contributes to the uh, increase in eating disorder? The BMI high, this is... I, that, that's the whole point, that's the whole point. I mean, this young researcher had a BMI of 18, mm -hmm. but she had this deep-seated, deep-rooted eating disorder. For me, it's not about admitting at your BMI, it's what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. And it's the control and the pathology, the yeah. psychopathology in here. And that's how I believe you should approach an eating disorder. It's not about how deep the cut is. It's not about whether you're severe an artery or as a patient of mine went under the artery and stuck his finger through that. It's yeah. disgusting. But, yeah, it's, but it's, it's a cut. And what's your intent with the cut? Do you intend to mm -hmm. let my young lad, you know, solve your toothache with, you know, two liters of vodka? Or do you intend to take five paracetamol and kill yourself? It's the intent. It's what's going on in there. <coughs> Do you know, perhaps I'm lucky, I've worked with some fantastic GPs. Um, I've also worked with some pretty dismal GPs. But I think because, again, the media is a double-edged sword. For example, I don't want the media here today because it is a double-edged sword because we are talking about very intimate, private details of patients. But the media as well is a sword that can work for you as well about educating people and helping them understand that there is help out there. And just because your GP, your family GP, doesn't actually understand eating disorders, there is help from other avenues. Yeah. I mean, I've actually had a GP coming to me and say, oh yeah, I don't like psychiatry, I just send them off, I just refer them, I, I, don't, I don't like to eat in psychiatry at all. I'm just brushing it off. But then again, I have GPs coming to me and saying, actually, I really enjoy psychiatry and I'm actually able to hold a lot of my patients. And I, you know, having the therapist work with me, I really enjoy that. It's a very, unfortunately, if you're working in the NHS, potluck. If you have a private GP, you have the choices, you know, but there is an increasing awareness. And I always tell patients, if you've got an NHS GP and they're not hearing you, stamp your foot, shout louder, because you will be heard. Unfortunately, that's how the system works. Yell and yell and yell and you will be heard. Anybody else? Any more questions? You, you mentioned about the, the ice and the culture. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. From a DBT point of view, yeah. yeah. What would you advise for a you know, under fifteen year old, as you said, in school in school circumstances? Okay. The rest of the school hides them effectively, everything knows who they are. I should um, what would you advise So a fifteen year old who's dysregulating? Yeah. Okay, so then I always tell people to carry their self soothe packs around. Now this has to be in junction with therapy. You can't just tell the kid carry self soothe pack. What are they gonna do with it? You know. So you actually have to have a therapist working with the kid, teaching the kid skills. And I don't believe you can start too early. So as I said, I ran an EIS team for 18 to you know it was 18 to 35 year olds, but there were also cams there. I said bring the kids in as well. Say guys, we're going to talk about self management, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness you know, uh, emotional regulation and mindfulness. You have to get this, this, you know, the skills into these kids at a very, very young age to help them manage themselves and understand what their needs are. Somebody who's dysregulating, a child who has a certain amount of skills, can understand, okay, I need to go somewhere quiet, maybe sit down and breathe. Let's do some breathing exercises. And actually, the more you do them, the better they are. Let's do some mindfulness-based work. Let's do some visualization-based work. Can't nothing beats a good therapist for helping these kids. Nothing. The problem is that schools schools are slowly letting in school counsellors, but they only do they only talk to the people I know. who go out and reach out for help, and then nobody does. Are you London based? Yes. What's happening? I've noticed more and more in London is that a lot of schools, at least in local areas that I kind of am around and I practice in, are asking therapists to come in from various services to actually go into the kids and talk to the kids about identifying things, learning simple things such as mindfulness-based, you know, behaviors and how to manage oneself, self-management behaviors, and also really kind of pushing these kids and encouraging them and validating them to ask for help. Mom and Dad, I'm not feeling great. I'm really struggling. So we are seeing a lot more. And I mean, I go into young adults and I do a lot of work. I go to people in the city, actually, and talk about them because nobody's taught them anything in school. So I should go to them and talk to them about it as well, about what happens when you feel like you're going out of your mind. How can I help you? You know, you are going out of your mind. There is help out there. But it is happening slowly, very slowly. Any other? Talking about schools, I, I think there's a lot of focus on obesity as well. There is, uh, absolutely. So in this day and age going forward, is it possible that a very high BMI potentially might be considered as an eating well, it's a binge eating disorder. We used to talk about that. You know, you can have BMIs. I talked about my patient with BMI if she had thirty two, but then again in the statistics that studies are over forty. <sighs> I, I'm not talking about binge eating, but, but the general view of my BMI. I think if you're talking about a higher BMI in the context of obesity, <coughs> in the context of obesity, and I think you're talking more about a sociocultural phenomenon. And again, I was watching this whole thing last night on TV, Save Money, Good Food, about how people have very, very fast lives and are eating processed foods the whole time, parents working full time, coming home, kids getting fresh fingers and chips. A certain about amount of education, so parents actually didn't have edu this, this particular family, didn't know how to freeze food, believe it or not. So the kids are just getting fast food. And you know, rather than actually fresh and frozen vegetables, which are actually very, very nutritious, I think it's more a cultural phenomenon and that these issues are coming up because the family unit, be it financial pressures, social pressures, emotional pressures, relationship pressures, the family unit sitting down and having dinner together, we te teach kids to eat, we teach kids to cook, we teach kids to talk. So again, in borderline personality difficulties, validation of emotions, understanding emotions, teaching kids how to express them, express emotions. All this stuff is really important. And unfortunately, I think the way society is moving these days, be it the pace of society, be it our values, be it the pressures of modern society, there is a movement, unfortunately, towards this diabetogenic obesity epidemic, which is very, very worrying, because the cost on the health service is actually very, very frightening, and more, because mortality rates are incredibly frightening. However, I think it's up to all of us, no matter what our field is, to educate people about the importance of talking. Is that around the dining table? Is that to the teacher? Is that to your friends? Is that to, to mom and dad? And talking brings out so many other things. It brings up how to eat. I have a patient, uh, an anorexic, well, a mixed eating disorder, both parents are solicitors, an American kid, who says, who says, 
Dr. Goswami, I don't actually know how much to eat for the meal. My mum has eating disorder and we've never sat down and eaten a family meal. So I don't really know how much is too much or too little. And she goes, but I've never had, because I've never had an example. So this kid binges and she restricts. And she has a mother tells her, if you're skinny, boys will like you. If you're fat, no boys will look at you. So if you kind of give kids these values, you're certainly going to become, have psychopathology, kids with psychopathology. What do, statistically, what do I see clinically? Clinically, I would say about 60 to 70 percent would definitely have traits. If not full borderline personality difficulties, they definitely have traits. But that's just what I see in practice. You know, obviously the statistics so are different things. And to different degrees as well. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you all very much.